Yeah, sorry for that. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Carlos Andrade. And I'm going to talk about the ground station system. Uh, the main idea of the ground station uh, is that it has been designed to encapsulate our programs, command transmission systems, and data reception systems to ensure a reliable and robust operation in harsh environments such as the Mexican uh, New Mexico desert. And it is primarily primarily powered by a Raspberry Pi 5 with various peripherals and a bottom panel uh, connected to a board powered by a Raspberry Pi Pico uh, that allows for sending commands to control the opening and closing of different valves of the engine system. Um, additionally, for data reception via radio of Florida, uh, we have developed a graphical interface uh, to plug to plot in real time uh, the data received from the engine, DAX system, and the flight computer. Uh, if you want to know, uh, this graphical interface has been developed with uh, Python, with the framework, with the framework Flask, and the for the backend, and we use for the frontend uh, JavaScript with the framework Vue.js. So the main idea is to have like a very strong system to to make sure that everything. Uh, comes uh, what goes well in harsh environment. Next, please. So, uh, to uh, so finally to end with the avionics subsystem, uh, we have developed a data acquisition board that is an important system powered by a Raspberry Pi Pico for monitoring the engine the engine oxidizer tank uh, during the filling process prior to a static a test or, or a flight. Uh, this system tracks key parameters, including the pressure and weight of the oxidizer tank using a 1,600 PCI pressure sensor transducer and a 300, 300 uh, kilograms load cell. Uh, additionally, it monitors the pressure of the ground support equipment that is a system of the engine uh, with another uh, trans PCI transducer uh, pressure sensor and measures the thrust produced by the combustion chamber with a um, one ton load cell. Uh, all, of, all of the data that we receive from that sensors, uh, we have like a redundancy system uh, to store that data um, the first method we have the LoRa telemetry that we can receive that data and save it into a CSV file, and we have like a lo local storage in board memory. So, yeah, I think it's worth mentioning that even though this uh, this electronic system was made primarily for our test bench, we will be using these uh, on flight on our ground support uh, equipment. Uh, so it, it serves both ways, right? So to, to test and for the main flight. So, Matias, adelante. Hello, nice to meet you, Paul. And great to see you again, Tom. My name is Matias Hernandez. I am the propulsion leader from Propulsion Onam. Me and Maximo, are, we are going to explain you the hybrid engine development for our second iteration of our hybrid motor. We choose uh, five things that we want to improve in comparison from our first iteration. The first one is to do to improve our uh, hybrid motor simulator. The second one was to improve the plumbing and instrumentation design. The third one is to improve the ground support equipment, also do the design of manufacturation of all of the parts, and at the end, the test and validation of the engine. Uh, great. Hi, uh, nice to meet you, Paul. My name is Max. Uh, nice to meet you, Tom, again. Okay, so uh, the part of our engine sizing uh, with our own simulator which we improved from last year 
is that now we're designing with trying to optimi optimize our sizing considering uh, factors that we can control, such as chemical compatibility, which is with oxido nitrous oxide uh, in 700 psi on our oxidizer tank. Uh, another thing that we wanted to improve as well was our safety, uh, the fact that our security of factor uh, something we wanted to improve uh, since last year. Uh, the ceiling, uh, we're now using uh, PTFE liquid and PTFE as a solid one uh, to prevent any leaks at big amount of pressure. Uh, we also try to improve a system uh, which we can reduce a lot of mass to make a rocket even uh, trying to make it less heavier and to help our the division of air structure to have a better design um uh, also something uh that we like unblocked this year is cnc manufacturing where we use i uh, talked to you about it in a couple of present uh slides and so and the economic economically viable so compared to other teams we don't have as much money as them so we're trying to use our own uh, trying to get help and using our own money. So we're trying to make the most basic design, but the better one. So it's two different things. Okay, uh, let's talk about the plumbing. As Tom knows, last year we had a really big problem at the spaceport because we didn't know that we should have an aboard oxidizer valve. So the last year we couldn't launch. That was one of the reasons of of the of the launch. But this year we add uh, a lot of valves to our ground support equipment. We add two uh, solenoid uh, purging valves and also uh, some manual purging valves. And for for the uh, flight pump plumbing, we add. The aboard oxidizer valve. We are using uh, God's valves. We're using Contrail uh, brass valves. We also have a relief oxidizer valve and ventilation valves for the for the filling procedure. We for our test bench bench configuration. We have two pressure transducers. One for the for measuring the oxidizer tank pressure and other one for the combustion combustion chamber pressure. The next one, please. Yeah. So as you can see in the PNID of the last slide, this is uh, the thing, well, the, our new GSC, our ground support equipment. Uh, I bet Tom's knows. Last year, it was literally just a ball valve and a pressure uh, manometer. Uh, so this year, as I told you at the first slide, we want to use safety as our, as our first uh, most valuable lesson. So we added, uh, two manual purging oxidizers valve and one for the a solenoid one uh, that con it's on the left and the right part of, of our filling oxidizer valve which connects the GSE and the uh, and the, our flight tank a rocket so we use the pressure transducer to know the value of the pressure uh, on our the, the the tank that we'll take from uh, Mr. Tom Sanders and we used as well a filling oxidizer valve, a con uh, contrail uh, oxy filling solenoid valve. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we have a great uh, and improved ground support equipment to have our filling procedure uh, to be more accessible, to have it uh, like to have it on our own hands, and that's something we wanted to from last year. We wanted to have accessibility and to control everything to know the pressure uh in the left part of our in our ground support equipment such as on our on, on our rocket as well so it's something we we really wanted and we implemented it this year uh next slide please ah yes so uh as as we told you before we now have cnc machine uh that our university uh, told us we could use. So yeah, we have uh, uh, different pictures. Uh, in the first one, we, we, we wanted to make sure you can see that we are now improving 
the not just the design but the manufacturing process of our of our parts of the rocket uh more uh, more important the the parts of the engine because we have a lot of uh, pressure inside so um, we did uh manually drilling for a part such as combustion chamber and an oxidizer tank we use the cnc machine for our uh, bulkheads so we now have optimizing the mass so we have less amount of aluminum in our parts which will reduce the mass and help uh, the rocket be less heavier and we use everything on our hands uh, it was free of charge that's what we are uh, using the uh, economically viable this is something our university gave us and we very much said thank you and this is our design manufacturing that we really improved since last year last year was a little bit more uh precario como old but now this year is a little bit more uh with the cnc and uh the computer numerical control so it's something we did improve since last year okay let, let's talk about the the really interesting part of our of our rocket that is the testing last year we have a lot a lot of issues at the filling procedure for the the tank the, the last year we tried to fill the tank uh, like five different times and we only could fill the tank just in one time. So the the focus of the testing in this year was to was to do a lot a lot of testing. We made uh, several several cold flow tests in order to fill the tank with liquid uh, carbon dioxide. And we have done the uh, hot fire static test like the, a month ago. And, and now we're trying to make another one because we make a lot of uh, changes at the ground support equipment that we are going to test in another hot fire static test. So we have the motor here with us. So do you want to do you want to take a look at it now or at the end of the presentation, Paul and, and Tom? Well, that's up to you. I mean, if you want to show it now, fine. If not, you can show it. Ah, later. okay. So okay. We're going to show the show you the motor right now. Yeah. So as uh, yes. So uh, as we told you, we made a static fire test. Uh, a little bit more than a month ago, uh, we made sure our rocket, our, our engine was in fact worked. I don't know if you can see it. Okay, oh, yeah. I'm gonna explain you the uh, combustion, combustion chamber. We are using now a, a, a graphene nozzle that it's uh, really good for us because last year we had a problem with a, a celeron one. So we changed the celeron for graphite that it's quite good. So this is the combustion chamber. We have our main oxidizer valve here. We changed, uh, we made a lot of change in the flow, in the flow with the plumbing, as we said. Now we are using yeah. bulbs. These kind of bulbs uh, uh, allow us to spend less time at the integration of the system. So here we have the, the oxidizer tank here. We don't have the all of the valves put here because we are uh, making some changes at uh, the geometries of the bulkheads. For example, uh, we are going to change in we are going to change some geometries here to the for the bulkheads. We also have uh, our instrumentation here. For example, this is like Yes, so the GSE, the ground support equipment that we showed you earlier, it's in here. So we are now, we're after this uh, meeting, uh, there, uh, we're going to test it. It's now a little bit more improved since the picture we, we sent you. And today we're going to probably go to our lab and make some tests. And I wanted to show you as well, the uh, you can see here, this hasn't been... Uh, 
being like optimal for the mass. But in this part, we can show you that we've been the doing CNC the, the CNC manufacturing. You can see that uh, there's a lot of space, space in here that can help us not just on reducing the mass, but on the assembly process, uh, again, with the clamps and as, as well in here. So we're reducing the mass. You know that every, every gram yeah, is, is a gram. Every gram counts or every pound counts. So also for the for the oxidizer tanks, the main goal of the division was to use uh, welded tanks. We tried to find here in Mexico an aluminum welder, but we couldn't find it. So we changed the welding for a normal radial bolt uh, joint for the oxidizer tanks. So I think in the, the state of the motor right now is that we're trying to optimize masses uh, primarily. That's what the changes in geometry, they're meaning. So yeah, we have a lot of uh, like over over material that it's, uh, we, we've made simulations in ANSYS uh, and it's not, okay. it's not using the, for the rocket. So we're going to remove those masses. Okay, can I, can I ask a question? You're changing parts but you've hydrostatically tested, and then you're going to be changing parts after your hydrostatic test. Yes, yes, we we're about to do another hydrostatic test for the for the tank. Yes, the main changes are only in the geometry of the bulkheads. So the the joints that are the mechanical ones are the same radial bolts. So in the last hydrostatic test, we made it with. The radial bolts, but the as I said, the only one then the changes are only in the geometry of the bulkheads. Okay. But yes, we are about to do another hydrostatic test. Okay, so you're doing weight reduction and then you're going to hydrostatically test after your weight reduction. Yes, we're going to do the hydrostatical and then another hot fire static test. Okay. Do you have are you having pressure transducers? on the rocket for your NOS pressure? Uh, yes, we have one on the, uh, as if you can put the presentation on our PNID of the rocket tank, uh, there we have three valves at the top of our oxidizer tank, uh, which is a relief valve, a ventilation valve, and the pressure transducer to have a, a real time, uh, yes, so the, the pressure transducer. Okay, I got it, thank you. Yes. Okay. So we the 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 reason we made a static test a, a month ago, like or a little bit more than a month ago, was to first we wanted to make sure our engine works, and then now that we know our engine works, we can now do the this couple of details of the mass reduction, the maybe improve uh, a little bit amount of NOx, and then a little bit less paraffin or whatever we could see, but, but we didn't want like last year that we made a static test. Uh, that little like two weeks before, and that was the space for a years. very big mistake of our part. Now we made a uh, static test two months before Spaceport and want to make another one uh, either this week or maybe the next yeah, one. Maybe the next one. Maybe the okay. next one. And yeah. this, week, this weekend, we want to make sure uh, we have a hydrostatic test. Uh, it shouldn't be uh, difficult or any problem. Uh, because we literally just uh, reduced the mass. We didn't change the plumbery, the plumber. We just, uh, the plumbing, sorry. Uh, well, we just like reduced a little bit of mass and that's why we wanted to do a hydrostatic test. And then next weekend, we are trying to achieve a, our second static fire test. Okay. And you're test firing this in, in a flight configuration. You're not using a hose or any connection. You have a, your NOS tank and your... Uh, okay, uh, the, the, combustion the chamber. Uh, okay, the configuration that we test it's it's almost the the flight one. The only difference is that in the test bed we we use a, a hose. So in the in the flight configuration we are not using this. But it's the only change. There's the the only difference between the flight configuration and the bench configuration. Okay, so I, I guess I. <laughs> Paul, help me out here. If if you're using a hose, 
How long is the hose and what's the ID of the hose? Uh, okay, we, as you can see here in the, in the third picture, we have a, a shield. That shield is for, for protection. So the idea of the hose is to, to connect the combustion chamber between the tank. But, okay, in the shield, we have a, a hole like this. So the ball valve cannot uh, pass through the shield. So we need to put a hose. It's just an extension for us to prevent that if something bad happens or the combustion chamber explodes, uh, first it can, uh, it, it cannot explode and just like the, the break and explode as well the our oxidizer tank. Yes, the, the, the combustion it's... chamber will not move the tank. Exactly. Yeah. So nothing else will happen, but just like the explosion of the combustion chamber. But it's it's our flight configuration. We are uh, actuating uh, from like a kilometer away from the, okay. the uh, our be our bench test, and okay. we're validating mechanisms and everything. The, the with last year's uh, test, you had your flight line, and I know that you've eliminated the potential of kinking of your flight line. I'm just wondering if your if your hose is providing, if you're using a hose for uh, your firing of the motor, if that hose is giving you the same flow characteristics as your flight yes. valve. Uh, That's yeah, my... they're, uh, all, uh, they're almost the same. They're, yes. they're almost the same. The diameter internally is like 98% the same as our Volvo. Yes, and also the, the, the hose is also it's not really long, it's pretty short, so there's not the Hitchler. Okay, so is the hose larger or smaller than your flight valves? No, they are, it's a little bit larger, but it's it's like 10 centimeters or 15 centimeters. Yes, bigger. it's not long. Okay. But it's, a, it's like the price we pay for the our oxygen tank not to explode. Right. Okay. I don't know what Paul, happened. are you okay with that? Uh, yeah, they, they say the, the hose is bigger than the valve. I don't see yeah, it. I, yeah. After, last year, there was there was definitely some issues last year. It looks like they've completely redesigned and, and eliminated that. So, okay. I'm fine. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We are using a free version of Zoom, so I don't know how much time we have on the on the meeting. Actually, it's uh, two minutes. All right. So, uh, do you want us to stop here and talk about the uh, air structures and uh, a new link? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do the air structure. All right, and then in your, so I'll send you the new link for it in by email. Okay. Goodbye. Bye bye. And yeah, all right, and let's go here. Yeah, everyone can see it, right? Yep, perfect. So, adelante, Juanjo. So hi, uh, my name is Juan Jose. Um, the Restructures Division will now talk about our work in the development of this new iteration of the rocket sheet lift. Uh, our main architecture is, consists in the following parts. The first part includes the components located in the nose cone that uh, are the avionics space and the payload and the two united by a friction, aluminum friction joint or coupling. <clears throat> this part of the of the rocket is manufactured in carbon fiber because we use the electronics systems of communication and useful. So we need to it to be in carbon fiberglass, sorry. <clears throat> Next, we have the main body, uh, which contains the rest of the, of the components, and those are manufactured in carbon fiber. 
and though the, these components are the recovery bulkhead that contains all the recovery mechanisms for the deployment um, of the two parachutes. We have next the upper airframe or the recovery tube. And next we have the, <clears throat> the main venting valve sections that are in the upper part of the oxidizer tank. These are united by, sorry. Uh, these are united by coupling, aluminum cup, couplings that are connected directly to the oxidizer tank. Next is the, the main, well, obviously the oxidizer tank and next the main valve section which is connected through the load transfer tube to the combustion chamber. And this transfer tube is designed to suit the engine's actuators. And finally, we have the lower frame section that contains the combustion chamber, the fins, and the bow tip. So the next, please. Hmm. Well, hi, my name is Mateo, and I'm in charge of the recovery system that is going to be integrated into our rocket. Uh, well, here in the first image, we have the recovery system. And the main components of this recovery system is the inferior frame, the superior frame. We have a, a spring, we have a 60 Newton solenoid, a CO2 tank. And also, we have an owl that is like a piece that has a really, that is really, really sharp. So we can open the CO2 tank. So, how does it work? This is a really important question because it's the system that is going to be in charge of opening the nose cone so we can recover our rockets. In first place, um, well, once the uh, the uh, the expected altitude is reached, that is approximately nine kilometers, the the, the flight computer is going to send a current to the solenoid. That is the once this happens, the solenoid is going to pull the rivet that holds the the spring and also the owl, and at the same time, this is gonna, this is gonna, um, well, with this, with when this happens, the the spring is gonna push the owl, and at the same time, this is gonna open the CO2 tank. And once the gas is released, the uh, pressure difference is gonna be created. So when this happens, the nose cone is gonna open. In this, uh, in this slide, we also have a tender descender. Uh, for this season, we decided to design our uh, our own tender resender, but it was really challenging because we didn't know a lot of things. Well, the last season we designed one, but we never get to prove it because uh, we <laughs> didn't have the chance to fly on the last on the last competition. But in this occasion, we decided to improve that tender resender. Uh, we made it a little bit smaller, and well, for the des for the mechanical design of this part, we have first to determine the loads that this system was going to be uh, subjected to. And um, the first one was the, we, in first place, we have to determine the, the load that this system was going to have to sustain to withstand, sorry. And we, for this, we use the second law of Newton and we get our result, we got a result of 1,016 Newtons. And also we, uh, the, the tender sender has a critical part that is the link retainer, and in this part, it's going to be subjected to sure, to a double shear stress. So we have to make some calculations to determine the the possible shear stress that we're going to have on flight. Um, once we got that result, we decided to use three sixteen bolts that are that are the ones who are going to hold on all the loads that I already mentioned. Can we pass to the next slide, please? Okay, for the parachutes, we have a drug parachute and a main parachute. Uh, the main parachute is gonna have a shape, uh, the shape that we decided to use for the main parachute was a flat extended skirt at 10%. Why decided? Why we decided this shape? Well, the reason behind this is because of the, well, this we with the investigation that we made uh, of this kind of parachutes, we saw that this kind of shape improved the drag coefficient and also, uh, we with this kind of shape we could have a more controlled descent. So that would be a little bit more 
um, efficient for us so we can have a good recovery of our system. Um, the material that we used for the main project was a uh, nylon rip set F111. And the terminal velocity that this one is gonna have is gonna be eight meters, eight meters over second square. For the drug parachute, we used a drug uh, balloon form. Why do we do, why do we do this? It was because um, it has a more control descent and also because it increases the drug coefficient. Okay, for the material, we decided to use a uh, a zero porosity nylon. The reason behind of this it was also because uh, of the shape of the same of the same parachute. Uh, well, we need to the parachute to fill with air so it can have a good, uh, so it works in the correct way. So we needed that the air stays on inside the balloon. So this is the reason for we decided to use a material that didn't have any porosity. And the CD of this one is going to be 0 0.94. And also the, the velocity that we are going to have with this parachute is going to be uh, 26.2 meters uh, squared, over second square. Can we pass to the next slide, please? OK. In this, in this slide, we have the recovery connections. Uh, we have the stage one, stage two, and stage three. In the stage one, well, we can see that uh, how our system is going to be, um, how the form of our system. First, we're going to have the drug parachute, the main parachute, the, well, first is going to be the drug parachute, the connections, main parachute, and then we're going to have our tender resender and the connection of the main parachute to the bulk kit. So in the stage two, we have the release of the drug parachute. Once the recovery system uh, opens the CO2 tank, the pressure difference is gonna open the nose cone. And when, when this happens, the drug parachute is gonna release, as we can see in the image of stage two. In this stage two, we can see five principal main cords. One that is connected to the drug parachute, another one that is connected to the nose cone, another one that is connected to the main parachute, and the last one that is connected to all of these uh, parts. So also in this image, we can see that the tender descenders, we decided to put them in parallel so we could have a better, a better, a better redundance of the systems of the system. Okay, so first the drug parachute is gonna release and it's gonna open. Once we reach uh, an unexpected altitude, the peritonic charge, the peritonic charge of the of the tender descender is gonna activate, and this is gonna release the main parachute. How does how does this gonna happen? Well, um, we can see here in the diagram that the cord that is connected to the main parachute has a kind of back, where the main parachute is is where well, well where is the part where the main parachute is gonna be. So once the tender descender activates, what is gonna happen is that it's gonna release the cord that is in the, well, that you can see that is connecting the drug parachute and also the nose cone. Once this happens, the same weight of the nose cone and the drug parachute is gonna pull the bag that is keeping inside the main parachute and it's gonna release it. Once this happens, the main parachute is gonna release and well, that basically would be all and we will be, and I will, we expect that we can recover our system and we're gonna keep uh, doing tests for this, for these parachutes, the, the parachute we have them in here. So I don't know if you want me to show them right now or at the end of the presentation. Uh, no, I no, I, I I don't need to see the parachutes. I do have I do have one question. Your your diagram shows the tender descenders in parallel. Yeah, that's correct. So when one of these releases. Uh, one of them releases, and let's say the other one does not. Uh, your bridle is still gonna release. Uh, well, well, technically, yes. That's the reason for we uh, we have two tender there, So in case um, one of them doesn't work, the other one is gonna do the work of releasing the parachutes. Is this the same design as last year? Uh, and 
no, no, it's oh. a little it's different. It's different. The connections are different. The last year we have a different connection system. Uh, but, you, but, you, have... but you were run, running a pair of them and running a if if one dropped, it would open this way or the, it would open the other way. So so either of the descenders would op would basically release the. Um, so do you have do you have that assembly that we can see? An assembly of the tender your tender descenders, how they're how they're hooked up to your harness. Um, the physical. Well, can we go to the slide before this one, please? Uh, another one. Yeah. Well, in the image that we have, well, yeah. it's not a, a really clear image, but we made tests, and in that image, the one that says tests, uh, we can see a little bit of how the. Uh, how the the quick links are going to be connected to our cords. I don't know if it can be seen a little bit more clearly, but okay. Okay, so what? let's let's go back to the uh, diagram of the uh, yeah that one. So yeah. what you have on the end of these tender descenders is you have a cable that goes from one to the other, and then the harness is actually. Uh, loop to the center of that cable because mm -hmm. that, that, now that i look at it it looks like if i look in the bottom picture the bottom picture has some kind of a cable uh that is uh you know is extended or released it's released on one side but not released on the other but the one that is connected to the pressure, sir the, the one that is connected to the main parachute? No, the point is, is okay. When your tender descenders, if one of them fires, uh -huh. then you have some kind of a cable or a chain or a link. A link <laughs> is what they had last year. But between uh -huh. the descenders. Yep. And then when one releases, that link actually goes slack and allows the harness to, to pull off. That's what they had last year. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. so the two were basically brought set together in one link between the two. So if either of the two were to release, uh, the harness would basically uh, fall free. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, just uh, it, the only thing I... I yeah, well, it, you know, uh, okay. Uh, that's that's a little that's a little unconventional because uh, a lot of times a lot of teams will have them in series, and then that means if one releases, then it then it lets go. Yeah, uh, and whether whether the other one. If one of them fail, there's always one to let go of the uh, uh, harness altogether. But th well, this this looks to work. Uh, it's just a little bit different than what I'm used to looking at. So yeah, well, as a matter of fact, we in the first design of the recovery connections, we have a uh, series connections. But well, after we with one of our partners, they told us that it would be more efficient if we use a parallel connection. But now that you're saying that, well, we could use just make that change well, so I mean, I mean this this looks okay it's just different than what i'm used to seeing. yeah uh, I, looking at the engineering on it it looks like it's okay as long as that main bridle uh slips off of that uh joiner easy yeah yeah what they had last year paul i thought was um it because of their tight confines in space i was I thought it was a really cool idea because it of the way it was designed. I had not seen it before, but looking at it, um, I was going like, wow, this is a really innovative way of basically utilizing two tender descenders. So uh, I had seen it last year, even though they didn't get to, to fly, uh, but the engineering was sound. And that's what I liked is it was different than what everybody else did. It was a different way to get the same the same job done, and I was impressed. Okay, uh, have have you done ejection tests on the rocket yet? 
Ground right. test. Ground test. Yeah, we have made an injection test already. Um, oh. So when you did your ground test, nose uh, came off easy, drug came out. Yeah, yeah, it come it came out easy. In fact, for the weight of the CO2 tank, we made uh calculations. Uh, so it could have the enough strength or the enough pressure so the nose can could open at the end. Uh, we okay. use the ideal gas law and other form. And you're using uh are you using shear pins? Yeah. Yeah, we're using shear pins. Uh what size shear pins? Shear pins three sixteen. Okay. Okay. And how many of those are you using? Five. Oh, okay. As long as you did a good good ejection test with those pins, then and those are nylon. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. We can move on. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, I'm Laura. Um, I talk about um the couple. Well, um. In the in the rocket, uh, there's three sections where the couplings are connected. The first is the after the recovery airframe. This is, which is connected with the male coupling in the upper valve. The upper valve is manufacture of carbon fiber and has aluminum coupling. This is because the lots are smaller than the low valve. Uh, the motor connects to actually the old valve, upper valve couplings, and the low valve, which also connect to the last part, the airframe, where the fins are located. Well, the couplings are manufactured from 6,061 aluminum. And in the next table, the table uh, you can see the characteristics. Uh, this is the, these characteristics, uh, they obtained from simulation in the part of the ANSI software. Uh, the next, please. <clears throat> well, uh, the low valve, valve um, is the important part for the rocket structure, no? This is the manual manufacture from the, in six, 1061 aluminum and in safe factor uh, three three point six six sixty sixty five um this part is optimized um because the axial forces and the moments in the rocket in the flight and um, the thrust, the thrust, the thrust, and the motor is this operation. Um, it was performed uh, in ANSI software. Next, please. Hi, so for the rock, uh, the rocket things, uh, as Tom may know, last year, uh, we didn't have the attack borders attached to the fins and during the computation. At the end, uh, when we were going to launch, we did have uh, the fins finished, but um, the problem was, was that uh, because of the motor testings and all of that stuff, uh, the integrations of the integration of the rocket wasn't finished until like, one week before leaving to the competition. Uh, so, and the manufacturing process was quite complicated. As you may see in the image, 
We are using a composite panel made out of aluminum and conical core and um, two uh, phase sheets of uh, carbon fiber. Uh, last year, we were afraid that we had some corrosion because of the materials used, but we didn't see any in, in one year, so it's okay. And uh, the changes that we are making, we are making the panel a bit thin, thinner. So it's now uh, 0.2 inches, uh, the composite panel. And uh, there are the measurements. The, the red cord is 12.34 inches. The semi-span is 0.43 inches. And uh, yeah, I can see the, the tip. Um, but it's more or less the same as last year, but thinner. And of course, lighter. So we already have the panels ready to cut as soon as we adjust up all the masses on the rocket, and we can attach them. And also the process of the uh, attack borders is simpler. So we can make this a lot faster and have the rocket completely finished um, at least two weeks before the spaceport. I don't know if you uh, have some questions. Um, let me see. And no, I don't know. I don't, I don't have much in the way of questions. I've already asked the questions that I needed to ask during the presentation. Um, so, so you're still waiting to put the fins on the body too. Yep. Yeah, we are yeah, adjusting some masses on the rocket, so, but we are um, ready to go as soon as we integrate all of the, the parts. Okay. okay. And you're attaching them how? Yeah, so the pin flutter velocity was calculated just with the panel. So as an extra matter of security, we are, um, we didn't take in account the tip to tip part that includes other four layers of carbon fiber. Okay. So you're going so, to attach it and then you're going to uh, do the tip to tip. Yep. Okay. 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 So yeah, basically in terms of a, of a rocket, well, I think they have a, the carbon fiber tubes and the nose uh, there with one, if you want to see them. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we 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 still have a the attachment of the fin pending, and and well, yeah, we have to retest our motor since we're changing the only the geometry of the bulkheads. Uh, we also have to solve. Uh, to be completely honest with you, uh, we have some leaking in the ground support equipment, so that's why we have to also redo the entire ground support. Um, um but yeah, we we'll, we'll basically we're. Uh, the recovery system, the avionics system is 100% ready. We have already flight tested uh, the avionics, uh, particularly our student developed one. Uh, we flew in a, in a smaller rocket, but everything well worked okay. The same with the CO2 uh, recovery system. And yeah, we still have uh, a lot of throwing to do with our tender descenders, just to revalidate and revalidate and revalidate. And I hope that the next weekend or so we can get more info on you with the uh, with the new the new geometry of the bullheads. And by the seventh of June and June seventh, we are making the official rollout presentation of the rocket and uh, at our university. So by that time, the rocket will be a hundred percent complete and yeah, ready for the pictures. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um... So, um, okay, I have no further questions right now. Uh, I will I will send an email to you in a little bit. And uh, uh, if I think of questions that I need to ask um, and procedures that need to be done between now and the 17th of June. Um, and so I guess we'll, we'll keep in touch. I uh, appreciate the video presentation, and uh, uh, I guess that'll uh, probably be it. Okay. So we have some questions about, well, of other things, but okay. first, uh, 
Yeah. We were talking with Tom about the launch tower that we are bringing to the spaceport. One question he already helped us to uh, how to attach the wires to the ground. But we have a question with the launch angle. Because he's telling us that the maximum one is 20 degrees, recommending us 10 degrees. And we, but we have in consideration five degrees of launch angle. So um, what I, do you think about that? Uh, ESRA and actually White Sands themselves have agreed upon a launch angle, but I can't recall it off the top of my head. Uh, I will get with the safety guy because he uh, he's talked about it in the past few months. So I'll, I will get the final number for you, and then you'll know what you're expected to have it set at. Okay. okay, but but they are they're adjustable depending on wind is what I understood. So it's not a, it's not a fixed launch, and it's not always a fixed launch angle. It's an adjustable launch angle, but an anticipated launch angle of. There 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 is a set angle. Uh, I I have to I have to get with this safety guy to. Okay. To, understand what are the caveats on that launch angle yeah because i because it's, it's okay I, i'm not sure that's the question that i had i did not know i know that securing it i after the fiascos that they, in the past basically i use you know concrete stakes uh three quarter inch concrete stakes instead of these little small you know awning pins for securement from so yeah, we'll have to uh, yeah. I, I'll put the angle, and then we can determine on what what you need uh, to get close to that angle. Yeah, well, so I, I, that's that's something I'll, yeah. I'll ask. Yeah, that's another reason why, uh, as soon as we're gone here, then uh, I will go through a couple of notes and contact some people and get you some answers back. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I yeah. did have also a question. Um, in the hybrid, I don't know in which part of the hybrid section, the, it, it stated that it, did we have only a 15 minute window to fill our run tank. So my, my question particularly is how strict is that filling window going to be and what constitutes the, the entire filling? Uh, I'm asking because in our, in our last test, Filling procedures uh, from checking leaks and and completing the filling took about forty minutes, uh, but I know that in uh, an Ezra document it states only fifteen minutes. You know, so I don't know how much problem do we currently have with that. I'll also ask about that. I know uh, I did. We did discuss a a dump scenario where you have to. Uh, what it takes to dump a tank down enough so that you can go back to the rocket and fix a problem. Uh, originally on, they were saying, oh, no, we want it empty. And I said, no. So um, uh, we, we've already discussed that. So let me go and take a look at the, uh, I will also talk to the safety guy because he's the one that knows all, these, all the information on this. Okay. I, I guess the, the F, once you, once you leave the, leave the uh the launch pad area and you you go to your safe distance how long does it take to fill your motor at safe distance once that's the question not checking for leaks and everything else once you're once you basically have left the, the launch area and you're now at you know your safe distance how long is your fill process that okay i will our fully procedure it's about uh, a half hour to get the the, the, the tank uh, uh, just the just when just when we open the nox valve it's around like 10 15 minutes but you know the what matthias is talking more about is like the the preparation and we do have to pressurize no, no. with co2 no, that, that no. Matter. Okay. yeah oh. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm just I, what I was what I'm talking about is how long does it take to fill your NOS tank on the pad? 
you know, if, if 5, 10 to 15 minutes is, is that's, I think, what Ezra is talking about when they're looking at that standard of how long does it take. You know, if you're filling your, your motor in a 10 to 15 minute window, yes, you have preliminary tests and checks for leaks and everything else, but that ultimate, when you're, when everyone has left the pad and you're now ready to fill and you put, and you activate your fill solenoid valve, a 10 to 15 minute window is, is acceptable. A 30 minute window, um, that's, I think the reason they have that 10 to 15 is so that you're not impacting other teams. Yeah, no, I think we're, we're good. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, that we're going to make uh, some changes for the, in order to to get the tank full in 15 minutes. Um, okay. <laughs> I think one of the things that you had before was your your um, your vent was excessively large and you were boiling off a whole lot. So you know, um, okay. Uh, our vent hole is uh, one on the thirty-two inches. So is that good enough? Is is point oh three two? Yes. Yeah, I that's that's in the range. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I, okay, I got, I got I got a, another question. The our filling hose is uh, a quarter a quarter inch. Uh, is that good? Uh, so you're using a four an braided stainless steel or or nylon. No, nah, no, it's a, a Teflon hose. Teflon, quarter inch Teflon. Yes, and the length is about uh, five meters. Yeah, the mo the important thing is the valve size. The the hose doesn't make a difference. It's a valve. Oh, uh, okay, 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 okay. The I think the fill valve they have is a three three eighth solenoid valve uh, for yes. filling. Yes. So it's right. it's a three eighth orifice valve. So. So the the valve is a three eighths, but then they're restricting it to a quarter inch. So um, what what's the size going into the motor though? Uh, the size is. Uh, what do you mean with the size? The size of the okay. of the uh, when your when your quick coupler on the side of your motor that you use for release. What size is that plumbing uh, going into your tank? Uh, it's a, a quarter. Okay. Well, a, a quarter inch. So it's so changing changing your fill hose really isn't going to make a significant difference. This okay. difference if you've got a quarter inch restriction downstream at that fill fitting. So um, you just I I would have probably worked up closer to the three eighths. But at this point, if you're still getting it in the 10 to 15 minute window, when you push the solenoid valve to fill, um, I think that's that's what the intent is. So. Um, okay. Okay. So. Uh, any other questions? No, I, I think we're good. Uh, Harun. Okay. Okay. Uh, Santiago, I'll, I'll be in touch. Okay. Sure. Paul, with email and and we'll uh, uh, we'll see if there's anything else that I need to go for before I go ahead and record your score. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Paul, we'll talk later. Thank, Thank you. you. Seeing you at Spaceport. Thank you for the time. Yep. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. See you. See you.